All right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. Uh, my name's Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, we're really excited, too, because February is our month entirely celebrating amazing women scientists and explorers around the world. In mid-February, we have uh, the International Day for Women in Science, and so instead of doing one day of Hangouts, we're doing an entire month of them. So thank you so much for being a part of our special month. We are joined by seven classes representing over 300 students from across North America. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout-out. We've got Miss Harrison's K-2s through twos in Ear Falls, Ontario. Hi guys, we've got five sixes in Zachary, Louisiana. Those are a lot of five and sixes. All right, we've got Miss Urban's uh, grade fives and six from Chilliwack in DC. All right, Canada getting back in the game. Uh, Miss Sims grade three fours from Coburg, Ontario. I like the mild delay there. That was awesome. Uh, all right, and then the three that have to deem it their own. So we've got Mrs. Editors, grade four from Hutchinson in Kansas. Hi, guys. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> We've got Miss Schooneman's grade four from Festus in Missouri. I, like, broke the mic, okay? And then last but not least, we've got Mr. Cameron's grade five sixes from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Hi, guys. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined live by Alisa McCall. So she works for Polar Bears International and gets to work on the world's largest land carnivore, one of the most amazing animals in the world, the polar bear. She splits her time between Yellowknife and Northwest Territories in Canada, where she is now, and Churchill, Manitoba, which has the awesome title of Polar Bear Capital of the World. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to let her join us and blow our minds with her amazing research and conservation efforts. Thank you so much for joining us, Alisa. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. And thank you so much, everyone who is interested in polar bears and tuning in today. I'm so excited to talk to you and to take your questions. Uh, like Jesse said, my name is Elisa, and I am the Director of Conservation Outreach and a staff scientist at an organization called Polar Bears International. And Polar Bears International is the only group in the world that's dedicated solely to protecting wild polar bears. So I have a ton of fun working for we call it PBI for short. And also, like Jesse said, here's where I am today. So I'm coming to you from this little red dot up in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada. So some of you, I think, are in British Columbia and Ontario. We also have Missouri and Kansas. So we're spread out all over North America, which is pretty cool. And the other place that I spend a lot of time is Churchill, Manitoba, which is right on the coast of Hudson Bay. And yeah, there's a lot of polar bears in Churchill at certain times in the year. Every single fall, I go to Churchill to watch the polar bears because at that time of year, there's a big polar bear migration. So Hudson Bay freezes over in the winter with sea ice, and that's where all the bears are right now. But in the summer, Hudson Bay melts and the bears come ashore. And by the fall, they're all waiting, lined up along the coastline waiting for the ice to come back and it's a fantastic opportunity to study them and watch them and so today what I wanted to do is talk to you a little bit about myself and how I got into polar bears then talk a little bit about polar bears and why they're so important and then talk about a couple very cool research projects that we have going on at PBI uh, projects that I think are really important and then I really look forward to taking your questions uh, so this is actually a little different than a polar bear, but this is how I got started in wildlife biology. So for any of you that might be really interested in a particular animal or any field of study, uh, just know that there's not only one path to do what you want to do. Sometimes life takes us in funny directions. Uh, but when I went to school, I loved animals and I wanted to help animals and work with them. And so when I finished high school, I went into university and I worked every summer 
as part of what's called a co-op program. I worked with animals every summer. And this is one species I worked on for many years. It's a deer mouse. I'm sure wherever you are watching from right now, you have deer mice around somewhere. And they're really important because they're a prey species for a lot of animals. And we put little GPS collars on these deer mice and I track them around the grasslands in Kamloops, British Columbia. So those of you in Chilliwack might know where Kamloops is. It's in, yeah, west from here for sure. Uh, and I just had so much fun. I loved um, studying these little animals and I learned a lot from this project. And my supervisor on this project thought I was doing a good job and I worked really hard and he knew a polar bear scientist. And so when I wanted to continue on with school and studying animals, he connected me with a polar bear scientist. So I went over to Edmonton in Alberta and I started my research projects on polar bears. So I've been studying polar bears now for almost eight years, I started doing a master's degree at the University of Alberta. And during school, I volunteered a lot with Polar Bears International. So I did a lot of talking about polar bears and I helped them whenever I could. And then when I finished school, I got a job there and it's been so much fun since. So a lot of my work has been out of Churchill, Manitoba, um, out on the sea ice and on land but also up in Takto Yaktak in the Northwest Territories, uh, north of me even. So there's no polar bears in Yellowknife because we're too inland. So when you go to the coast in the Arctic, there's polar bears. Uh, and it's been so fascinating to study polar bears. They're just such an interesting animal for so many ways that I wanna tell you about. But first I wanna build a little bit of context. So polar bears live only in the Arctic. We don't have any polar bears in Antarctica. Uh, and those little squares and shapes that you see right now, those are all different populations of polar bears. So we have 19 populations of polar bears around the north. But you know, there's actually not very many polar bears at all at the North Pole because it's so dark and cold up there that there's not a lot of things living up there. Uh, there's not a lot of seals. And so polar bears don't really go there. Polar bears like to be where there are a lot of seals because that's their very favorite food. So we usually find polar bears over relatively shallow waters that freeze over with sea ice. And they live in five different countries, Canada, US, Norway, Russia, and Greenland. And so it can be really complicated to try to study the whole species since they're spread out over such a long distance. Uh, but we think there's about 25,000 polar bears in the world right now. And of course, they only live where there is sea ice. And if you don't remember me, that's okay. And if you don't remember much about what I talk about today, that's okay too. But if you remember one thing, I want you to remember that polar bears need sea ice. So they absolutely depend on sea ice uh, to hunt seals. Polar bears are evolved to use this habitat. So you can see how much they fit in with the Arctic. They evolved from a brown bear ancestor to become white. Uh, they have two layers of very thick fur that keep them warm in the Arctic. They have a very thick layer of body fat, very sharp claws and very sharp teeth that help grab seals out of the water and pull them up on the ice so polar bears can eat. They have an amazing sense of smell, but you know they don't have as strong jaws as brown bears. Their jaws are weaker than brown bears. Brown bears eat a lot more foods on land like roots and berries and uh, they rip meat and so they need really stronger jaws. And seals are a little bit squishy and so you don't need to have as strong jaws to bite through seals, but you do need to still have sharp teeth. And so polar bears are just so well adapted to the Arctic. It's really where they need to live. And they really do need sea ice as a platform to hunt those seals. Polar bears are good swimmers, but they can't outswim a seal in the water. They need to use sea ice to help sneak up on seals. And sometimes they'll wait by a seal breathing hole for a really long time, hours and hours and hours, until a seal comes up for air. And then polar bears will dive in and grab the seal. So polar bears absolutely need sea ice to find their food. But they also use sea ice to travel. So polar bears walk huge distances. One polar bear can cover a range of over half a million square kilometers, which is bigger than the state of Montana. So one polar bear can occupy a lot of space. And they also find each other on the sea ice when they need to mate. They navigate to each other using the ice. And some bears even den on the ice and have babies on the ice. So the sea ice is so, so important to them. But you can tell by the sea ice, it's a really fascinating habitat. And when we do conservation biology, that means that we're trying to protect our natural resources. And for some habitats, it's a little more straightforward than others. So 
I bet a lot of you have heard of something called deforestation. That's when um, people cut down big areas of forest, like the rainforest. So sometimes people will go in and log and take down a bunch of trees, and that can affect animals in an area. Uh, but if we want to fix deforestation, we can um, you know, put a fence around the forest to protect it, or we can fine people that hurt the forest, or we can plant more trees to protect that forest and the animals in it. But sea ice is a very different type of habitat. If, if you look at this, now how would you go protect the ice in this image? Could we put a fence around it? Or could we just grow more of it wherever we wanted to? No, we can't. It's, it's really special that way. And it's, but it's cool because we can all work together as a global community to help sea ice. The best way to protect sea ice is by living greener lives ourselves, no matter where we live. So the reason that we're losing Arctic sea ice right now is simply that the Earth is warming. And when it gets warm outside, ice melts. I think you've probably all experienced that in the summer. Maybe you've had a slushy drink and had it melt on you. So what's happening is that as humans burn fossil fuels like coal and oil and gas, we release carbon pollution into the atmosphere. And carbon pollution acts like a heat trapping blanket. So it just keeps too much heat against Earth and it makes it warm up too quickly. But if we can switch from those fossil fuels and use things like solar energy or wind energy, uh, then it keeps the atmosphere cooler and we can protect sea ice and polar bears. But it's not only about the polar bear. So polar bears are a type of animal that we can call an umbrella species. And we call them an umbrella species or even a keystone species. It's because they're so important in their ecosystem that everything we do to protect them protects everything underneath. So the Arctic sea ice is like soil is in a forest. It grows the base of the food chain. Algae and little animals grow in the sea ice and they feed things all the way up to the fish and seals and polar bear. So everything we do to protect the polar bear is good for this ecosystem, but it's also good for us. You know, when we do things in our own community to reduce pollution and carbon, that's really healthy for us too. So it's really neat to look at protecting the polar bear. And we know that we can protect the polar bear. We're already seeing fantastic things happen in the world, people switching to different energy Energies and students like you being interested in protecting their environment. If we were to do nothing at all, uh, if this is how many polar bears we have right now, then by the end of the century, this is how many we would expect to have. So we do know that we are going to lose some polar bears if we continue losing Arctic sea ice. But at PBI, we are very hopeful that we can protect the habitat and protect this animal and keep them healthy all throughout the Arctic as long as possible. Now, to do this, we have to protect them, and we can only really protect them well if we understand them better. And this is where science and research come into play. So the better we understand a polar bear, uh, the better we can help it. And so this is part of a project I was on last spring. This is on the sea ice outside of Churchill again. This polar bear is just um, asleep for about an hour and we're measuring it. So uh, we can take little samples of hair. Uh, this was a subadult, so it's like a teenager polar bear. So we measure its length and body width. Uh, we can measure the size of its skull. We can find out how old it is. And if we can do this for bears over a long period of time, we get a way better idea of what the population is doing, um, where it is on the sea ice. We can look at what kind of type of prey they're eating. And all these things help us make better plans of what we're going to do to help the polar bear. Now, here's another project that we're working on to help polar bears. So there's all sorts of different types of projects we have that help teach us about polar bears and what they need. So this is one project that PBI does with a few different partners. It's a maternal den camera. And so we can put out remote cameras. We can sneak up really quietly, start this camera, and then leave it alone for months on end. We don't have to be anywhere close to it. And it will just run. And we can monitor moms coming out of dens with brand new baby cubs. And this is really important for us to look at uh, because it can teach us about how healthy these families are. We can take a look at how healthy mom is. We can count the cubs. How many do you guys see? I see three. So that's pretty good. We don't often see triplets. So this is really cool to see. And we can look at, you know, what they're doing outside the den. And over time, we get a really good idea of what families are looking like in the Arctic. And in some areas, moms and cubs are being impacted already by changing habitat. And we hope that this project will help us help moms and cubs. 
This project can also help us protect moms and cubs in areas where there's a lot of human activity. So one area is in Alaska. There on the North Slope, there's some oil drilling. And it's an area where polar bears like to den. And so we want to protect polar bears, and so do those companies. And last year, this polar bear mom denned right under this oil bridge, which was kind of crazy. So this company shut down the whole site. Uh, they asked us to put a camera up, we did, and everyone had to leave the area, and they watched the camera every single day until the mom came out with her cub. And then she came out on about March 18th, so just after St. Patrick's Day, and she stayed for a couple weeks, and only after they were absolutely sure that they'd left the area uh, did production start up again. So as the Arctic is changing, we're gonna see more and more human activities across the Arctic, and this means there's gonna be more human-bear interaction. So these types of things that we can do to help keep the bears safe and help out people are really important. Another really important way to learn about polar bears is by tracking them. So polar bears prefer to be way far away from any people. So they like to be way out on the sea ice where it's dark and cold and hunting seals nowhere near communities if they can help it. So how do we learn about what they're doing when they're nowhere near people? One of the best ways we've found to do this is by putting GPS collars on polar bears. So you guys might, your parents might have GPS in your cars, uh, or maybe you've heard of GPS before. We can put this little collar on a female polar bear. It lasts about one to two years, and we can learn where she is every single day, and we can uh, look at the sea ice data from satellites and compare the two so we can see what type of sea ice she needs and is using to hunt on, where she's moving and when, and we can find out so much more about what females need, especially females with cubs. But males, their necks are too big compared to their heads. So we have not been able to collar male polar bears. So for years, we've been missing a really important piece of data for these populations. But as of last year, we can finally start tracking male movements, which is so cool. So GPS technology has gotten so good that it's now a lot smaller and we can put little earrings in male polar bears and now we can track them for up to six months on the sea ice to find out where they're moving. And this is gonna be so important for us because now we can help more bears, not just the female bears. This is also important because it tends to be the males and the young bears that kind of get into trouble in communities so along the coastlines, uh, there are quite a few communities of people. And with these tags, we can warn communities if we see a polar bear on the map that's moving towards the community. So this can be a really important tool uh, to keep people safe as well. And tracking is also so cool because it can show us when bears are swimming. So this is uh, some research I did a couple years ago. Um, and we looked at where bears might have been swimming um, above Alaska and in Hudson Bay. And this was our record holder. This female bear swam over 400 kilometers. So that's about 250 miles in nine days. So that's like over 4,000 laps in an Olympic swimming pool. I don't know, you guys maybe can think of how long that would take you to swim. And maybe even you could look at a map and see how far away uh, 400 kilometers or 250 miles is from you and imagine swimming that distance. So polar bears are good swimmers, but it's really energy costly to swim this long. Uh, that means they burn a lot of calories and use up a lot of energy and they're not really eating at all when they're swimming. So they lose a lot of body weight. This is really hard on polar bears um, and especially cubs. We know that some females have lost their cubs after swims like this. And these swims are becoming more common as the sea ice continues to change. Now, learning about how polar bears burn energy is also a really important area of study. Now, how do we know how many calories a polar bear needs or how much weight it's going to lose if it moves a lot more? This is where our partners in zoos can help us really better understand polar bears. So this is Tassel, who lived at the Oregon Zoo, and these are her two keepers, who are just fantastic ladies, Nicole and Amy. And they, along with a couple other partner zoos, have trained their polar bears to walk on treadmills. And they also have a swim flume, which is like a swimming treadmill. And thanks to these polar bears, who are just amazing, we've been learning about how many polar bears, how many, sorry, calories polar bears need to eat and how many they burn when they do things like swim and walk. And as the sea ice continues to change, sea ice is moving more and more, so it's becoming more like a treadmill. And so science like this can help us really better understand the future impacts of sea ice loss on polar bears, how much more they're gonna move, and how many seals they're gonna need to eat to make up for that. 
So this sort of stuff is super important and super interesting. And I mentioned to you before that keeping people safe is really important. Anytime we talk about conserving animals and protecting animals, we can't forget that a lot of people live with animals and we can't forget that people are dealing with things too. Um, it's really important to take communities' interests to heart when we're like learning about different ways we can protect animals. Uh, Churchill, Manitoba is a really good example. As Jesse said at the beginning, it's the polar bear capital of the world and they get so many polar bears moving through the community. Uh, it makes a really good testing station for us to test new technology. And this is one thing we're testing this year. It's a radar system, and we've set it up on the community center, and the community center in Churchill has the school and the library and a curling rink and a hockey rink and the hospital. Everything is in this community center. It's super cool. And we've put a radar right on the roof, and it scans those areas in the red circles where we know that polar bears walk through. And we're teaching the radar what a polar bear looks like so that when it picks up a polar bear it can send a text message or an email to the people whose job it is to move polar bears out of town they're called the polar bear alert team they actually have a whole team in churchill dedicated to moving polar bears out of town and they even have a polar bear jail uh, for for the bad offenders and so we hope that this tool will be a really good detection tool for the community and help keep people safer so all these different ways of of using science uh, to understand polar bears keep them safe protect them and protect people are so important these are just some of the projects that we're working on right now and it's so much fun to be able to come up with some of these ideas and see them in action so with that, I would just like to invite you all to help us protect polar bears together. They're an amazing animal, but again, everything we do that helps polar bears is also good for people and other animals. Uh, they're such a special species, and we feel really lucky to be able to talk to people about polar bears. And if you'd like to join us or your teachers are interested, at the end of February, on February 27th, it is International Polar Bear Day. So on PBI's website and Facebook and Twitter, we're going to be doing live events all day. We're going to be posting cool facts like this and neat pictures that you guys can use in the classroom. And we're going to talk about polar bears all day long. It's going to be a super fun day. And we also have our thermostat challenge that day. So this is a challenge you can do at home or in the classroom. And we simply ask you to adjust your thermostat by one or two degrees, uh, depending on the temperature. So for me right now, it is about, it's, only, it's pretty warm here for Yellowknife today. It's only about minus 31 degrees, which I think is about minus 24 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So I'm in Celsius. Uh, but I keep my thermostat turned down just a notch or two. And instead, I'll wear a vest and thick socks to keep warm. And I keep really cozy that way and save some money and save energy, which is good for polar bears. And I would also can ask you guys to tune in to our live cams. Uh, so every fall we have live cams in Churchill, Manitoba. We've got polar bear cams and you can watch live polar bears all throughout October, November. It's so neat. This polar bear last fall, she was digging in some kelp. And even though this isn't her main prey species, she found a little meadow vole that she ate up. And it was pretty cool to catch that on the camera. It was like my two research projects combined, my little small mammals and then my big mammals. Uh, so definitely check out those cams. There's also a beluga cam in the summer. This is a really neat way to help feel connected to the environment. Um, yeah, and get even more inspired. And I just want to give a quick shout out to my team. So whether you like science or art or writing or anything, there's always ways you can get involved. Uh, this We have a small team at PBI, and everyone has different backgrounds. So we've got three scientists on staff who do a lot of, of course, science and research. Uh, but we also have BJ. He's got a background in photography, but he's basically become our engineer, and he helps us get out those maternal den cams running. We've got Marisa, who's got a background in psychology, who helps, she worked in a zoo for years and helps us do all our zoo coordination. Emily did women's studies and now is our marketing coordinator. Uh, Barbara here is an amazing writer, does our communications. Meg over here is an artist and a scientist. Janet, background in TV production, she does development, and our our executive director, Krista, was a science teacher. So we just have such an amazing background of people. No matter what you're good at or what you love, there's always ways you can get involved with all sorts of cool things. And with that, I would love to take some questions. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. Thought I'd show you guys. I'm really excited to hear what you guys want to talk about. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Elisa. Here, make sure they see that clip. Yeah. Uh, also, 
only a northern Canadian could say without a trace of irony that minus 31 is an appropriate or reasonable temperature, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, before we get to the classes too, we have 10 or 11 now classes watching online. If you guys want to submit questions in the YouTube chat bar, I can pass a few along, so just make sure to do that. Uh, but while we're here, uh, let's start with Miss Harrison's class. Just you guys have a question? Nope, don't touch anything. Hello, I'm Hi. Hi. So this is Braylee, and she has a question. You can go ahead, Braylee. How can we help the polar bears? Oh, such an important question. Thanks, Braylee. Uh, the best way to help polar bears uh, is by doing things that reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So that might sound kind of tricky, but it's really actually pretty easy. So really easy things that you guys can do are recycling and turning lights off and biking to school or walking to school. Uh, but if you want to go a little bit bigger, some really neat things that you can do are encourage your parents uh, to maybe consider different types of energy in your home. So solar or maybe a hybrid car. And when you get older, and you can talk to your parents about this too, uh, we can make sure that we're voting for people who care about the environment and protecting our future environment. Um, and just become really important community leaders. You guys can do your own projects in your own school. We have a project called Project Polar Bear, and we give a lot of support to students around the world that want to do uh, kind of green projects in their school. And so I would encourage you to check that out for different ideas. But there's, no matter how old you are, there's ways that you can help polar bears no matter where you live. Outstanding. All right. Let's go to uh, Zachary in Louisiana. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, my real question real was that when the polar bears act up, what would happen when y'all sent them to a polar bear jail? <laughs> yeah. Good question. I thought I would get a question about that when I mentioned it. Uh, so the polar bear jail, it's a big structure in Churchill. It can house, I believe, up to 23 polar bears. And what happens is that um, Churchill is laid out in three zones. I won't go too much into detail, uh, but we're monitoring the three zones all the time. The polar bear alert team is. And when the polar bears come into zone one, that's the actual town. So that means that the managers will go out there. They will dirt the polar bear and they'll put it to sleep for a couple hours. If the polar bear is a bad offender and it's been back a few times which many of them are uh, they'll take the polar bear to the jail and it really does get put in a, a small-ish cell. Now, at this time of the year, the polar bears aren't eating anyway. They're all fasting because there's no food on land for polar bears, not much anyway. So the polar bears stay in the cell. They do get water, but they don't get any food. Uh, they get a little bed, and they wait. And they'll be kept for three to four weeks, and then they'll be released. Uh, some of them get flown by helicopter to a different area. Uh, if, there's, if the sea ice comes in early, then the bears will get released right onto the sea ice. So basically, we're trying to teach the polar bears don't come into town or else you're going to go to jail for a couple weeks and it's not going to hurt you but it's not very fun and we try to keep polar bears and people safe that way and this program's been running for a few decades and it's really cut down on the number of injuries that people got and the number of polar bears that got killed uh, so it's really important in Churchill that they have this program it's really different there's a lot of things online about it if you're interested a lot of video clips too it's a really unique program I don't think there's anywhere else in the world like it really <laughs> <laughs> I would expect not that's awesome all right uh, let's go to Miss Urban's class um, what are polar bears main predators oh good question so because they're at the top of the food chain they really don't have any Actual predators, um, in certain areas, humans do still hunt polar bears. It's all based on a quota system, and it's only people from cultures like the Inuit who have been hunting polar bears for thousands of years. Um, but really not many polar bears are hunted every year, considering the whole population. So pretty much only humans and then other polar bears. So occasionally polar bears will kill each other. There is some cannibalism, it's not very common. Um, and occasionally, more rarely, but sometimes wolves will go after little cubs. Um, if When the females leave their dens and walk to the sea ice, um, if they're in areas around Hudson Bay, they den on land and then walk to the sea ice. And in between that trip, sometimes wolves will try to get the cubs. Um, but it's not very common either. So really polar bears live a good life at the top of the food chain and are more focused on hunting other things than being hunted. Cool. All right. Uh, Miss Sims class, do you guys have a question? There we go. Yeah, you're good. How long do polar bears live in this climate change? 
How long do they live for and does climate change impact that? Yeah. Is that right? Perfect. Yeah. Just a little quiet. Really good question. So uh, polar bear uh, females and males live different lengths. Uh, so males can live into about their early 20s. So males fight a lot more. They have to fight for girlfriends pretty much. Uh, so they have it pretty hard and they get more beat up. So they only live to their early 20s usually. And females will live uh, into their mid or late 20s. Uh, in zoos, of course, they can live longer because they're a little more pampered. So the longest polar bear that ever lived was 42 years old. She lived in Winnipeg. And that's an excellent question about climate change impacting them. Um, once polar bears are an adult, so far, the adults seem to be able to figure out changes in the environment. They're really smart. Um, but we know that it has been getting harder on the young polar bears uh, to make it to adulthood because the ice is just changing so much more and it's harder to find food. And so it's really hard to say right now whether it is impacting how long they can live. But we know that overall, we've seen some declines in polar bear populations related to sea ice. So we do think climate change is having an effect on that. These are great questions, guys. All right. Yeah. For the next three classes, you guys love to demute your own mics. We're going to start with Miss Editor's class. If you guys want to come up, go right ahead. Do you think you'll keep studying polar bears? Oh, that's a really nice question. Um, I would like to for a long time. Um, I really love studying polar bears, but you know, the more you get out and see the other animals, um, I just have so many questions about other animals that we'll kind of see where life takes me maybe. I know that one of the most famous polar bear scientists, his name is Ian Sterling, one of his favorite animals to study of all time, even though he kind of laid the groundwork for polar bear research, he really thinks seals are what we should be studying. And I kind of agree, seals are the main prey for polar bears. And if we don't understand seals well enough, how will we understand what's going on with polar bears if that's their main food? And so I could definitely see looking at related animals. Um, but I hope I get to stay in the Arctic for a while because I do love studying Arctic animals. And I've gotten used to the cold and I have a bunch of parkas and chooks now, so I'm ready for the cold. But you know, I do miss the mice sometimes. I really like studying mice too, so we'll see. <laughs> awesome, all right, let's go to Miss Schuneman's class. Do you guys have a question? Come on up. How do scientists know that recent climate change is largely caused by human activities? Oh, very nice question. Uh, so we can tell, we know that the physical properties of the carbon that's in the air um, are what's trapping heat. And we can look at human activities over time and compare that to thousands of years ago. And we can actually map the type of carbon in the air. So the type of carbon that people release is different than the natural carbon in the air. It has a little signature on it. And we can compare this and we know that all this extra carbon that's in the atmosphere right now has come from people. And because carbon does trap heat, we can really relate those two. And there's a lot of science out there looking at this in different ways that's pretty darn convincing that humans are a big contributor to this. The really great thing is that there's so many alternatives to carbon. We don't need to you know, totally change our lives. We can just switch to some other things that we already have. Uh, solar is a big one. The sun is shining on us all the time. It's been the Earth's main fuel for as long as the Earth has been around. And now we know how to harness the sun and we can move more that way and get some of the carbon out of the atmosphere. And so even though humans caused it, we can fix it. Uh, just like the ozone layer was a problem years ago, but we've made some changes as a society and almost fixed that too. So we really can make some positive changes when we work together on those things. Awesome. All right. I'm glad that question got brought up. And then we'll go to Mr. Cameron's class. Why oh, do you oh. want to research and explore animals? Oh, oh. Um, I just have always really liked animals, I guess. I grew up um, kind of in a nature-y household and was close to the woods and go hiking on the weekend. And I just loved animals. So I grew up with pets, um, but I didn't want to be a veterinarian. I didn't want to do, you know, the surgeries and, and the blood stuff. Um, but I just felt a desire to study animals. Maybe some of you have, um, you just really like maybe astronomy or electricity or all sorts of different things. Um, I just, I thought it was important to protect what we have, and I wanted to make sure that all the humans that live after me get the same opportunities to see the same animals and to live in a, a clean environment. So I just really love doing what I do, and I've just stayed on that path. 
Awesome. Along those lines, you mentioned possibly studying other animals with one of the earlier questions. Well, one of the questions we just got online was, have you studied any animals other than mice or polar bears? This is from Addison in South Carolina. I have. So I spent uh, one summer studying an animal called the spadefoot toad. It's a really cute little toad species. Um, I was studying them also in British Columbia. And again, we put little backpacks on them and track them through the forest and woodsy environment. They're a really unique little toad. Uh, so that was great. And I've also had opportunities to work with badgers. Um, I also worked at a wildlife park for a while and worked with all sorts of animals from uh, camels to moose to goats and uh, a wide variety. But yeah, my main focus for many years now has been the polar bear, but I'm sure lucky that I got to work with other species first because every animal is unique and important in its own way. Marvelous. I know we're doing polar bears today. I urge all the classes to look up spade foot toads because they're some of the coolest things ever and they can do some yeah. really neat stuff when it gets really dry. So just Thank you. Yeah, they're so cool. <laughs> all right, we have time, definitely time to go through another whole round of questions. Alisa, you're good for another seven questions? Totally, yep. Awesome. All right, so back to Miss Harrison's class then. Oh, thank you. Second one. Every hand goes up, okay. Oh my God. Say hi, I'm Tucker. Hi, I'm Tucker. Hi. How, how tall are polar bears? Oh, great question. Okay, so I'm gonna, I think in metric because I'm Canadian, so I'm sorry for you Americans, but how, here I can say this, when a polar bear stands on its hind legs and puts its paws up, it can almost dunk a basketball. So that's how tall a big polar bear can be. It doesn't even have to jump, it can just stand and dunk a basketball. So they are, and they're about up to my eyes, so I'm about, um, I'm five foot three, so that's, I think everyone knows how tall that is. And a polar bear standing on all fours uh, could be almost taller than me. It'd be probably up to my shoulders or eyes on all fours. So they're the biggest bear of all. And they get even bigger than brown bears. So they are huge. And they can weigh, uh, males can weigh 1,100 to 1,400 pounds. So I bet that's, you know, the size of all your classmates put together for some of you, or at least half your class. And females weigh about half of that. So males are twice as big as females and often can be twice as tall sometimes. So they're pretty big. Outstanding. All right, let's go back to Louisiana. You guys have a <laughs> I have a question about uh, how aggressive are polar bears? Yeah, that so that's an excellent question. And you know, it varies. Um, if we look at averages, polar bears don't tend to be as aggressive as brown bears. So brown bears that live on land, they have territories. They're very territorial. They have to protect the resources that are near them. So they get very aggressive to protect that area. But polar bears, because they have huge home ranges and have to go a huge area to find food, they're not territorial, uh, which means they're not as aggressive. But uh, that doesn't mean that some aren't aggressive. So polar bears are kind of like people in that each of them is different. They're all individuals and they all have their own personality. And some polar bears might not be aggressive, but some are. And there's actually been a few specific polar bears that have been very aggressive. Uh, there was one polar bear around Churchill that was known for actually jumping at helicopters and trying to pull the helicopter down, which is just crazy. Uh, that polar bear ended up getting into a lot of trouble in the town. It was very aggressive and it ended up having to get put down, unfortunately. Uh, generally, polar bears aren't, aren't too, too aggressive. Make sure when we're good. in polar bear country. Alisa, is your computer good or is my computer the one that's screwing up? Sorry. Uh, mine, no, that's okay. Mine seems pretty good, hopefully, okay. good for other Mike, people. Uh, sorry for interrupting then. No, no, you're so, good. We'll go to uh, Miss Urban's class for the next question. Are you allowed to touch or pet polar bears or will another polar bear smell that and then uh, want to attack them? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so the only time we ever touch a polar bear is when we are, of course, researching it and it's been put to sleep safely for a while and we do all our measurements and leave. Um, as far as I know, even though polar bears have an excellent sense of smell, I don't believe that they attack each other when they might smell like other things. Uh, many, many times we've handled a polar bear one day. And then we've seen it the next day and it's been fine and moving around amongst other bears and there's been no problems. Uh, so I would think that they don't really mind that. 
Um, I think polar bears definitely pick up on human smells a lot, but I don't think it's a type of smell that would make them attack another bear. Polar bears only really tend to fight each other. Um, well, if they're super, super, super hungry, uh, which doesn't happen too, too often, or when they're fighting for mates. Um, and that's when it's really about females. I don't think one would just attack each other because it's pretty risky. You're putting your body at risk and your health at risk uh, for a weird smell. They'd probably just get away from the bear if they didn't like how it smelled, I think. But that's a really interesting question. Yeah. All right, we'll go back to Miss Sims class. You guys have a second question. What does the inside of a polar bear den look like? Oh, cool. Um, I'm wondering if I have any pictures right now. I don't think I do. Uh, so it depends what type of den. So it can be either in the earth or in the snow. Um, and the main things is that it usually has a couple chambers. So it's a pretty good size. Uh, you can see where kind of mom has been and the cubs have been and then there might be a couple little chambers off of it. Usually one entrance, sometimes two. Uh, they can be a little bit smelly, of course, after a bear is been in there for many months and we often see fur that's stuck to the ceiling of the cave. Um, and we see claw marks quite often. So you see where they've been kind of scratching around the mom and the cubs. Uh, and so we do have programs where we've gone into uh, dens after the polar bear has left to check it out and take samples. There's been one case, one of my colleagues, thought a den was empty and went into it and the bear had not yet left. And so those guys got out of there super, super quickly, but that doesn't usually happen. But basically it would just be like kind of smelly cave, um, a big, you know, a good size, not too big with a lot of scratches around it would probably be the best way I could describe it. Yeah, they're kind of neat. <laughs> and they'll get reused too, which is cool. Awesome. All right, let's go back to Mrs. Editor's class. Just come on up guys and uh... Go for it. Unless everything's gone black. In which case, we'll come back. Oh, maybe they're there. I don't know. We'll come back. Okay, we'll go to Miss Schuneman's class instead. If you guys want to come up and ask a question, uh, go for it. Could polar bears be saved by moving them to Antarctica? So, yeah, that's a super cool question. Could they be saved by moving them to Antarctica? Uh, this is kind of a thought experiment that we do sometimes. Uh, humans have a really bad track record of moving animals to try to help them and then um, messing up the environment completely. Uh, so we do think that if we moved polar bears to Antarctica, they could survive for a short period of time. This is because the seals in the Arctic they have evolved with polar bears. And so they are really aware when they're above the water, but underwater, they're super chill. They don't have very many predators. But in Antarctica, it's different. So the seals and the penguins in Antarctica are way more worried underwater down there because there's orca whales and leopard seals, which are predatory. But above water, they're super relaxed. So a polar bear who hunts above water would probably have like a total buffet of seals and penguins for a couple years because uh, everything would be really relaxed and the polar bear could kind of go pick them off. Um, but over time, this probably wouldn't work out very well because Antarctica is land that's covered with ice. Polar bears are really used to being over water that's covered with ice. Um, they'd probably decimate the Antarctic ecosystem before it could rebound. And we just don't think it would really work out for any species involved, even though maybe short period of time it could work. Um, we feel like it wouldn't be very fair to penguins to try that. But, you know, it's neat to kind of think the different possibilities. Whenever you make a change in one ecosystem, because everything's in a food web, you see changes throughout the whole thing. And you kind of think about what happens at every level uh, down that food, food web. So it's a really neat question. And I don't think we'll ever do it. I think we'd rather protect the Arctic than kill all the penguins. That might not be so good. I think we have penguin researchers that do hangouts with us and they'd be very unappreciative. <laughs> yeah. Great totally. question. Yeah. Uh, two quick ones from online before we do our final ones of the classes. What color is polar bear's skin under their fur? It is black. Yeah, we don't really know why. Maybe it traps the warmth better, but they do have black skin. All right, and then the second quick question is, what else do they eat other than fish and seals? Yeah, so it is mostly seals. Um, 
Sometimes during the summer, especially when humans are hunting whales, uh, they'll pull the whale onto land and carve it up and leave leftovers that the polar bears get at. And when polar bears are stuck on land for long periods of time, they'll definitely eat eggs and berries um, and scavenge on, you know, a dead caribou or kind of whatever they can find. There's still bears who love to eat, uh, but all the other food sources don't really give them enough calories. It's really that fat that they love to eat that helps them bulk up. Awesome. All right. Last two questions for classes. We'll go to Mr. Cameron's class first. Do you guys have a second question? Anyone have a question, Mr. Cameron's class? Yep. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chase, and my question is, has a polar bear ever attacked you, and do you know why? So a polar bear has never attacked me. I've been very lucky that way. Um, a couple years ago, a polar bear did attack a girl that I know in Churchill, Manitoba, and we don't really know why. It was um, early in the morning. She was walking to work. It was a young polar bear that was really hungry and probably didn't really know what it was doing. And she survived, and she's doing great right now. Um, so polar bear attacks aren't very common, but we're worried they will get more common as bears get hungrier and smell more food and go into towns. Um, so, so far I've been very lucky, but I'm also very, very vigilant. Well, everyone is, even the girl that got attacked is vigilant. Sometimes you, you just can't help it. So uh, fingers crossed that never happens. Uh, I never get attacked by polar bear. I try to be extra, extra safe when I'm in Churchill. That's one good thing about Yellowknife. Is there's no big predators around, so I can kind of relax when I'm out on a walk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then last but not least, we'll go back to Mrs. Editor's class. Do you guys want to come up for a second question? Go for it. Yep, you're good. Polar bear to study. Sorry, do you mind repeating that? Do you have a favorite polar bear to study? Yeah. Favorite polar bear to study. You know, I don't know if I do. Um, there was one polar bear for a while that I was tracking. So I helped put a collar on her and then tracked her uh, for two years on. Uh, well, on my computer, basically. And she did some really cool movements. She ended up denning on an island in the north of Hudson Bay, which was so unique. Not many of the bears do that at all. And she made these huge movements and had two cubs. And so I thought she was just the coolest bear. She did so much interesting stuff in those two years. Um, but really, I think that it's so neat that they all have their own preferences. You can watch um, 10 bears do completely different things when they get out on that sea ice. The way, that, the way they hunt, their strategies, how they move. It's all really cool to watch. So and they can be really hard to tell apart when you look at them, of course. So um, maybe if one was a little more obvious, I could <laughs> have more of a favorite. But really cool question. Awesome. All right. So, guys, uh, there's been a great hangout. At the end of every hangout, what we do is I'm going to demute every class's microphone. So, Miss Harrison, go to Louisiana, Miss <laughs> Irvin, Miss Sims, if you can join me in saying a big thank you to Elisa for joining us today. So, thank you, Elisa. <laughs> That was awesome. awesome. Alisa, that was outstanding. Thanks so much for everything. Thank you guys so much. You have fantastic questions. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.